Welcome back to My Climate Hunt. I'm Mike, and today I'm kicking off a new series and idea of videos where focused on what I wish I knew and quite literally go over exactly that. What I wish I knew back then when making decisions on different products or techniques when getting into saddle hunting, climbing, whatever it may be. And I'm going to kick this off with the simple figure eight repel. And we're going to go through some of the things that I thought about back then, what I learned and what I'm doing now today instead. Let's get into it. Okay, so when you buy a figure eight repel or you're looking to go buy a figure eight repel, you can go through Amazon and find tons of options, tons and tons of them. Uh, so I'm focusing just on figure eight, like there are other options for repel. Essentially at the point in time, about three years ago, I wanted to start utilizing more rope style techniques and I knew I was going to repel. So I said, well, I know figure eight repels allow me to repel. Let's go look at one of those. So I went on Amazon, typed in figure eight repel, found this product here, only $8, and I bought it. It did not it come did not. with instructions like you would see looking like this or even looking more like this or something even like a general information pamphlet that'll go through all the tips and care and how to use it, what not to use it for. And that left me just really looking at videos or pictures of how do I implement it. So at the time, all I knew was take the rope and wrap it around the body of the figure eight. And now I can repel this in my break hand. And this is the strand that I'm carrying my load on. Well, I did learn that there are other ways you can do so and started to experiment with those over time, but found that when I started to come back looking for more options to be more optimal about how much friction that this has on it, I was quite surprised to find something. So this led me to this idea in this series here of which I want to go through showing off some different descenders that you'll see. And let's go into how do we find this stuff out ourselves? So I can't possibly cover every single figure eight out there. I'm going to give you a few examples here of ones I looked at and how I got to that point. So if I go back to Amazon and you find one that, okay, I like this one. Don't just click into that particular product and then just look for the instructions because it may or may not include it in the listing. I found it to be much better to literally search for the product and find it on his website. So like climbing technology, this rescue eight here that we see with the ears, I was able to come here and find there's an instruction and declarations which then gives you a PDF just like this. And that's what we're looking for. We don't have to buy the product and wait for this to come to then figure out what we can and can't do with it. Seeing this ahead of time and then getting it in person allows us to have more opportunity to read through it as well in case we need a refresher. But we can do this now and understand if it's going to be the right fit for us or not before we even buy it. So be when we go and look through these different sorts of sets of instruction, and I'm just clicking through a handful that we're seeing at this point, know that there should be, in almost all cases, some form of contact information you'll find. So if there's anything you're seeing in the document itself that you're not sure about, or you want to get a little bit more information on, look for that information, because I did find this those resources to be very helpful. I did reach out even in terms of just for Black Diamond to get a little bit more insight because when I was looking up above here, I saw that there was a graphic here that essentially would contradict something I found online as being a way you can use your figure eight repel. So whereas when I went to another one like this one, I saw for like Pestle's figure eight descender, like the square eight, it does say that you can implement it, but there are some risks and concerns you should be aware of depending on what you're trying to do with it. So if you're not following around, along quite well, what that means, what we're talking about is just pulling a bite of rope through and capturing it like this, instead of wrapping the rope around the body of the device, like you would see here. Okay. So if we get it back to here, what I found, and I've tried this method even myself before too, is there's very little friction that this puts on here. Like 
I only have this on a camera stand and I'm just pulling with my thumb and that is so effortless. Okay. It'll hold if I just let it go, but you see how not stable this is too. Like this carabiner can flop all over, right? And that is why when we look at, get rid of the clanging here. If we go look at this graphic here, I've reached out about this one specifically. That instability is why from their testing, they won't recommend that approach. And if that's what you're looking to do, like I would say based on like, at least from Black Diamond Super 8, you should look elsewhere, okay? There are other products out there, even if it's not a figure eight repel, that you could use where you'll get the kind of friction you want. And we'll get to some of those in a moment here. But if we go back here, even looking at Petzl's who recommends it, uh, there are concerns of not recommended use. And the rest of them, you see this half circle, their little key and legend here says that's for exceptional use and great experience only. So understand, especially if you're first starting out, when it comes to a, a figure eight descender, if you're not planning to use it in this orientation, whether it is SRT or even DSRT, where you would put both around, if you're not planning to use it that way, then I would look elsewhere for a different device. Like, yeah, just save you that time and heartache right there. Something else to keep in mind, like when you look at these, is the rope size. Not all of these accommodate the same diameter. So, like in this case here, it's just saying no less than eight millimeters. This is Canyon Elite nine millimeter. So this is what that's the one advantage you'll see to you those of you out there trying to consider maybe I should go to an eight millimeter row, especially if you're considering SRT. Like noted a lot of products, you're starting to really push the boundary into what you can do in an eight millimeter. But if you're doing DSRT, you're kind of in a safe area where you'll still be able to operate with both because if we were to go and look at the Super 8 here, this is saying for that one, 9 millimeter. One for SRT, 9 millimeter. Now, this is not a black diamond, but that's all, like, for 9 millimeter, that's as light of a rope that you can basically get doing a single strand. So whether you're rope climber or just one sticker and you're just rappelling and you have an 8 millimeter and you want to get a Super 8 from black diamond, no, that is not recommended. You're outside the range, and I would look elsewhere. Otherwise, if you were doing like doubling or a twin line and you were pulling both through, like we see that with at least seven and eight, you're good. Okay. So, again, not all rope sizes are accommodated by all figure eights, and they all have different sizes that they'll recommend there as well. Uh, which, again, that'll probably be on the first page pretty much in all of them. There's it is on the uh, Petzl's here. It is at the very top here on the mini A. This one's only telling us max size at this point uh, at this from what we're seeing here. If we were to look at this Rescue 8. Here we are. This one was off the R style, which would be here. So you can only use 8.7 to 13 or you can get down to eight if you were doing a DSRT or twin line at that point. So consider that. Uh, to look at your climbing system before you go to pick one of these. If you're going to be SRT, then you may need, in, if you're going to do SRT and you're going to try to get aggressive with eight millimeter, you really need to look harder for the kind of device that's going to support that for you. But if you're nine and to nine and 11, from what I found, you're pretty much in a safe spot. Uh, you're in a much more affordable territory than much more, many, let's put it this way, there's more options for you if you're in that diameter. So um, something else that I learned as well is that there is a concern with the, the simple eight in that you could run into a risk of creating a girth hitch, which Bailey, all they're saying is, and I think really the rope diameter could put a big impact on this. Like you're, you're rappelling down of a tree, you get hit by a limb, it brushes up. Well, technically, if you don't try to correct that, this rope will fold up and create a girth hitch like this. And now it's not going anywhere. Now you have to get your climbing load off of it before you can start to rappel again. Otherwise, you could, if you do the right convention, there's a way that you can implement it. 
where you get this element on the front side of you so that even if you were to rub against something on the back, it won't get in your way. Um, which also brings me to another point. It's if we go to the pestles right at the very beginning. Don't lose your Hewitt. Again, I believe that's how they want you to pronounce it, but apologies if I'm getting it wrong. But uh, they're giving you a convention on how you can go get this from you, the climber, onto your climbing rope without dropping it because all the instructions are going to say, don't drop it. Seems pretty obvious. But if you're not sure and you're not following this along, I did just recently make a short of this exact same convention that I've been doing when I use a simple eight. So if you didn't see it, check it out. I'll have it up here in the video uh, in this area somewhat. Um, go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, that's a great way to get this device while using it in the, again, the optimal design. Not drop it and get it onto the rope itself. So all of these different factors here to consider out. Oh, there's one other thing that's worth mentioning here. If we were to go down into pestles, we'll actually see them talk about using a backup method. So the shunt or Prusik in this case, this little device you're seeing here, we'll zoom in a little more, make it a little bit more obvious. They're recommending that if you're operating your figure eight, that you should have some kind of backup on the brake side. So this would be going up in the tree itself. And on this side, they're saying to have some kind of Prusik loop or a shunt attached to you so that you can essentially, if your hands were to come off, especially of those when you're hunting up there standing for a four hour sit and you're getting tired, your limbs are getting a little bit stiff, your joints are a little sore, like you need <laughs> a third hand is going to be awesome to have. So implementing something like a Prusik loop or a shunt off of your saddle is a great element to include. Having any kind of redundancy or backup is going to be very important. So uh, for those of you that may be rope climbing uh, or operating on friction hitches, you'll see here, and I'll even put a little video of myself doing so, uh, having a friction hitch on top, on top while then having your figure eight attached, you already essentially have a backup above in that case. It's just the only thing you have to make sure with a backup above the device is that you get the load off of the friction hitches and get it entirely onto the figure eight itself. So again, you can see that more in the little clip that I just showed, um, but implement a backup, super simple. We'll make a video later on to kind of walk through implementing that ourselves. Um, but note that even in these instructions themselves, they're mentioning you should use a backup as like with anything, you should have redundancy in your system. So considering the rope side diameter, considering the element around girth hitch potential implementations, what's acceptable, what's not, uh, which to touch on that just a little bit more, if the manufacturer is not willing to put a rubber stamp on those implementations or tell you that it's recommended, it's like essentially what I'm saying is give you, if they're not giving you something like this, for to say yes or no to that particular implementation that you see, you either need to seek professional instruction for that to understand like from somebody who has like gone through thorough testing, the pros and cons of it, or you need to look elsewhere. Like if the manufacturer won't put a stamp on it, why should you? Cause I won't, I'm not going to look at that device. I'm going to go elsewhere, which all of this has led me to this particular product here, which show it on the screen is the Kong Oka. So not technically a simple eight. It's, um, it's just really referred to as a canyoning descender at this point, but it has led me to a device like this. So uh, when we look at this particular product, it's solving a lot of different problems that we highlighted in the other ones. So one, I can put in a carabiner to this and it had this rubber boot that'll essentially keep this secure in place. So even if I shake this around, there's no rattling, which is great. I don't have to load this up with a bunch of stealth tape or medical tape just to get it quieter. Uh, so implementing something with like a, um, a uh, canyoning or sorry. Um, yeah, a canyoning approach where I just pull a bite through and put in the carabiner. It's not a problem because the boot here is essentially keeping this stable at all times. So even if it is loading the carabiner, it's not going to get walked around. It's not going to essentially lose its position. 
to see that staying in the correct orientation all the time. And the other great thing that I love about this product is the amount of variability you have. So looking at the instructions here, you can see there's a lot of different ways you can implement this that were tested and signed off by the manufacturer itself, uh, both with things you should be cautious of. Again, a very common thing operating the brake hand side. You're not leaving that alone unless you lock it off, which you can see here it is saying like, yeah, in this way it is okay. But I can really play around with the many different ways, both in DSRT and SRT, to get this as smooth or as little as I want. Like even just pulling down on this, like it, it's going to take a bit of force for this to actually slip. And I don't have to operate nearly as much effort on the brake hand side just to slow myself down, which for me was a huge win because in the winter time we get a little bit heavier with our climbing load. So as it asks through a couple extra slices of pizza or a couple extra layers of clothing, uh, you, I find comfort knowing that even if to say I'm just not having the best day, I'm not, my energy is not quite there. I can put that one more wrap on there and I can then slow myself down for a more comfortable descent. Whereas like, I don't have to worry with like a simple A where there's not that many ways you can, like the manufacturer at least has tested and said, yes, go ahead and do this. Um, I don't have to worry about that. I can just take that off my mind entirely. So, um, so that's what led me to this particular product itself. Uh, something that's worth noting if you are interested in this product, since we're already talking about in spirit of it, is this graphic up here in the top right hand corner. So over here, I thought this was saying rope. <laughs> don't use bad rope. I don't know why, but anyway, they're showing carabiner. These are the shapes they advocate for. These are the shape they don't advocate for. So we're talking like a pear shape like this, or we're talking uh, something like a D style carabiner or a square, I should say. I don't have one of those uh, to show you, but they don't want ovals and they don't want the, that would be the D shaped carabiner. And then this graphic here, which is important to note, is that's referring to the thickness of the bar on the carabiner. So like a DMM BOA, like you see right here, about 14 millimeters in diameter on the bar. I didn't know that until I started researching a little bit more, which again, talk about carabiners of what I wish I knew because I bought a handful to eventually land on the DMM Ceros, which is similar to the Rhino, except the Ceros has this little wire gate for stability and preventing side load. So uh, then the rounded bar here actually comes in about 12 millimeters, uh, which fits in the specifications for this knife. Otherwise, uh, you really got to force this in there and then you destroy the rubber boot, which they give you a couple extra inserts, which is good, but just don't bother. So that's one thing to call out. I'm going to be doing some testing, more testing with this. This is really becoming my preferred way to do so because of its versatility. And if I needed to essentially like position, reposition it, it can hold itself in place. Again, without having to put tons of medical tape and stealth tape on things, I can't, I personally can't stand having to do that with all my stuff. So um, something to keep in mind if you're going to go for something like the Kong Oka. Um, so that, uh, oh, and one last thing, this is talking about the shape of the bar as well, which I didn't highlight well enough. Uh, so this is more square with the DMM BOA and the Cerros or Rhino, like I mentioned, is a little more round, which is what it wants, opposed to something where you'll find a lot of these. I mean, a lot of carabiners have this sort of tapered spine on the top here. That's not what they want. And that's what you see depicted over here on the right. No to that uh, because it leaves a little bit of spacing in the rubber boot itself. It wants to have that completely stabilized. So, um, so look for something with a rounded bar, round it entirely. So there's lots of them out there. I actually found that a lot of them, it's very common to find rounded ones in screw gate. Personally, I don't care for screw gate. Um, I want to have a triple three stage action carabiner. So, We'll talk, yeah, talk about carabiner more at a later time. But uh, that essentially is everything I learned about the Simple 8 
and where it has led me to eventually going to this product. So if there's something that you've learned about the Simple 8 that you have professional training with and want to share it, please put it in the comments section down below. There may be something that I'm missing here. And by all means, if you like seeing this kind of content, give me a thumbs up and subscribe down below. Seeing that can help me know that this is valuable and I should keep doing a little bit more. So I appreciate your time and patience with me through this all. Remember, look for the instruction, look for the specification based on the climbing rope and system that you're going to be implementing, and make sure you seek out advice or questions and support if you're not sure if it's the right fit. So stay safe, and I'll see you soon.